Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor and glory. And today is the 27th day, right David? Yes. Yeah, today is the 27th day of the 7th month of the year 2019. Dear brothers and sisters, today I'm here to help our six-year-old son David. He has, I believe, five extremely urgent visions and two words, extremely urgent word, pointing us to Messiah's extremely, extremely imminent return today, David, as the cover sheet for us on screen, as we see, Messiah's return is extremely, extremely soon, dear brothers and sisters. It is time that we indeed take Lord Jesus Christ at his word. Dear brothers and sisters, Messiah said in Luke 18, 8, Will the Son of Man find faith when he comes? The question lingers today. The question lingers for every true born again believer every single day in our life. That rhetorical question should haunt us. Will the Son of Man find faith today? If we are struggling to understand what is faith, Hebrews 11 chapter 1 defines for us that faith is 100% hope, 0% evidence. And if we try to understand more, Romans 8, 24 tells us that hope that is seen, that what kind of hope is that? So once again, that is supporting the fact hope is 100% hope, 0% evidence. And whatever is done without faith, Romans 14, 23 tells us is sin. So today, as David shares the extremely urgent visions, David tried to draw for us, of course, we'll put it up on screen. So as David shares, dear brothers and sisters, once again, let's hang our hat on Luke 18, 8, Hebrews 11, 1, Romans 14, 23. Let's try to ponder on, let's try to contemplate on. As a matter of fact, today, David has a message for us. It's a, indeed a staggering message. He'll be talking about the Beatitudes once again, solely, solely guided by the Spirit of God. So, and then we will pick it up on our First Peter, book of First Peter, chapter 2. Probably we'll be able to do a couple of verses, but more importantly, today we will be talking about how to glorify God, how to glorify God, and how to be fruit-bearing in these end moments because John 15, 8, the wine and the branches discourse, dear brothers and sisters, Messiah said that when we bear fruit, we bring glory to our Heavenly Father. So bringing glory, glorifying our Heavenly Father and bearing fruit walks hand in hand. They go hand in hand. So hopefully, once again, dear brothers and sisters, you'll have enough time to be with us till the end. Once again, if time is your limiting factor, dear brothers and sisters, please, you can watch it in parts. Please pray over this message is indeed Messiah has his appointed people. Messiah has his appointed purpose for his appointed people. Let us yield to the spirit of God. So let us not delay further. Let's jump in once again. Start with the word of prayer. First John. First Corinthians, excuse me, First Corinthians 2.14, John 16.13 tells us, dear brothers and sisters, that how crucial it is to invite the presence of God. The Spirit of God is not an accessory thing, it's a mandatory thing. Every single time when we hear a message, once again, let us remember to be guided by the Spirit of God because Romans 8, 5 through 8 tells us in our flesh we are enemies of God. That's a bad place to be. None of us want to be there. So today, let's bow our hearts. We'll bow our heads and let's invite the presence of God so that his purpose be accomplished during this time. And let's start with the short word of prayer. Shall we, David? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. 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 We just praise you, Lord. We give you all the praise and power and honor and glory. Father, we just thank you for one more glorious day, one more glorious message, one more glorious reminder, Lord, that our faith is about to become sight, that we are about to be be with our Redeemer, that our redemption draweth nigh, and that we 
will be seeing that one man who gave it all he had and we will be having the privilege to see him face to face we will be we are in the time of having the privilege to see you face to face lord we just praise you we just thank you today lord we bring all our dear fellow brethren in your presence lord we bring all our doubtful thoughts doubtful hearts in your presence lord and pray lord as in the mark 9 the dilapidated father the broken father pray today we pray each for every single dear fellow brethren of all our dear brothers and sisters for each one of us including me and my family lord today help us lord to overcome our unbelief and believe lord that your return is extremely imminent and upon us help us lord today to believe you to take you at your word today help us lord once again to fight this good fight of the battle of the flesh and the spirit today lord we thank you father that we know that we know that we know lord that thou art our god and will be our god forever and ever that thou art you will never leave us and you will never forsake us forever and ever that you said lo i am with you till the end of time lord those staggering words help us lord may those words when the enemy tries to defeat us may those words ring in our ears for every single of our dear fellow brethren let those words resonate in their ears let those words resonate in their thoughts lord we bring each one of us in your presence we thank you lord that by thy grace and thy grace alone that you have called each one of us and not by any merit of our own god's riches at christ's expense we thank you lord for once again allowing your only begotten son giving him to butchery literally slaughtered he was literally slaughtered so that we could be one day part of heaven we thank you lord today once again we thank you lord for being our father for being our redeemer for being our all in all father today we once again pray for each and every single of our dear fellow brethren lord as we go through this time, through this message, through the words and visions, Lord, once again, help each and every single of our dear fellow brethren, Lord, help them, strengthen them, empower them so that they can fight the good fight, yield to the Spirit of God so that your purpose be accomplished through them and in them, Lord. Please, once again, increase in each one of us, Father, in every single of our dear fellow brethren, Give them a renewed appetite, Lord, a renewed hunger for thee and thy word, so that we each might grow in your grace and knowledge. But we each also, Father, we each might be more discerning, more perspective to what you precisely have for each one of us in the days that remain today. Once again, I bring David and myself in your presence, Lord, and we pray that we pray, Lord, as we convey your message, Lord, to your appointed people, please be our strength in our weaknesses, Lord. We anoint every alphabet which comes out of our mouth and pray, Lord, whatever is not from you, whatever is not from you, please let it not happen through us. It is impossible. Matthew 19, 26 tells us, but through you, everything is possible. So today, please, claiming on Psalm 143, 141 verse 3, we claim, Father, that please we pray that today, please do set a guard over our mouths and keep watch over the door of our lips as we convey your message, Lord, to your appointed people and as at this moment, in the name of our coming and reigning King Yeshua HaMashiach, using our authority of Luke 10, 19, we bind every evil of the enemy which is coming at this time, at this message, at this video, at our, all our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters, and we pray, we pray that we pray for the hedge of protection for each one of us right this moment. And Father, once again, we pray that may this message reach to your appointed people to accomplish thy mighty will, Lord. May only your mighty will will be accomplished through them and in them please do enlighten the, the hearts and minds of all our dear brothers and sisters lord and help them fill them with your holy spirit lord and help them to understand what you precisely have for each one of them through this message we thank you once again father and we commit all our dear fellow brethren each one of ourselves into thy mighty hands this time this message every single thing we commit unto thy mighty hands without any reservation whatsoever in the name above every single name of Yeshua HaMashiach your suffering servant and our Redeemer our Lord our Savior our coming and reigning King Jesus Christ of Nazareth Amen, amen. and Amen and Amen
All right, so dear brothers and sisters, once again for all the visions, today David has five visions. Once again, dear brothers and sisters, for five visions and two words, of course. Every vision and word, dear brothers and sisters, we do keep praying as the Lord leads us, as He points us, and that's how we share. We wanted to mention, dear brothers and sisters, so we have five visions today which the Lord wants us to share. The first three visions were on the 15th day of the fifth month of the year 2019 and this was during spending time when David was spending time with the Lord usually he spends time with the Lord in the evening this was during why he was spending time with the Lord in the evenings the Lord gave vision one two and three and the first vision David will share with us the first vision and then we'll go to the second and third and you can please go ahead David so I saw Lord Jesus Christ standing holding a shofar and I heard him blow the shofar. It was a very long, a huge shofar and it was brown in color. Lord Jesus Christ was wearing a priestly dress and also he had on himself the breastplate of the high priest. Then I heard a a very loud shofar blast. It was very, very loud as Lord Jesus Christ was blowing the shofar. And that was the end of the vision. Praise God, praise God. Does that remind us, dear brothers and sisters, of the trump of God? First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, does that remind us of the shofar, the trump of God? Dear brothers and sisters, we are indeed moments away from being caught up with Lord Jesus Christ. The second vision was on the same day once again. This was during spending time with Messiah with, and during evening once again. The second vision and you can please go ahead David. I saw a very big wooden cross. Then I saw the sky with white clouds. Then I saw Lord Jesus Christ standing on top of one of the clouds. Lord Jesus Christ was wearing a very bright yellow robe and a blue sash and that was the end of the vision praise god praise god messiah the lord himself will descend in the cloud does that remind us of lord descending in the clouds dear brothers and sisters we are in that time frame when the lord himself will descend in the cloud he is about to descend in the cloud and the third vision was on the same day again during the same time and you can please go ahead david I saw two doors open. There were no turnouts on the doors. There was a black curtain round with a green veil. The veil was pulled already. Then inside I saw the throne of God. It was very bright. The throne was shining in gold. Then I saw God sitting on the throne. He was extremely bright. Very, very bright white. And also, I saw three angels on each side of the throne. And that was the end of the vision. Praise God, praise God. Soon and very soon, dear brothers and sisters, does that remind us that come up hither. Revelation 4, 1, soon and very soon, we will be going to fall at Messiah's feet at his throne and sing the song Revelation 4, 11 and 12 tells us, Revelation 5 tells us, that's the time we are in. And now coming to the fourth vision, it was on the 16th day of the fifth month of the year 2019. And this was once again during the, during spending time, during evening, while David was spending time with the Lord Messiah gave him two visions, visions four and five, which the Lord wants us to share today. So the fourth vision is, you can go ahead, please, David. As I saw a big wooden cross standing on a grassy ground, and then the vision ended. And then I heard Lord Jesus Christ say, I love you. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Today, dear brothers and sisters, the phrase... I love you, we don't quite understand because in our heart we think love is horizontally, but we don't understand that God's love is unconditional, agape love. That's a staggering love that doesn't depend 
on how what we do. It's independent of what we perform or what we don't. God loves us beyond any word can explain, dear brothers and sisters. Isn't that staggering? And coming to the last vision today, Messiah wants us to share. It was on the same day once again, on the 16th day of the fifth month. And this was during David was spending time in the evening. And you can please go ahead, dear. I saw a Bible. It was very colorful. And down it was written in green. Holy Bible. And then the vision ended. And as soon as the vision ended, I heard Lord Jesus Christ speak. And he said, be ye ready. Praise God. Be ye ready, dear brothers and sisters. Be ye ready. That's the time we are in. Lord Jesus Christ is telling us to be ready. We see in the vision, the Holy Bible. So, dear brothers and sisters, what can we infer out of it? That Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that the only way to get ready is... By dwelling in his word, through his word, through his word, we can be ready. And coming to the words today, two words Messiah wants us to share. This was in the seventh month, this month, of course, the seventh month of the second, second day of the seventh month of this year, 2019. This was once again during evening while David was spending time with the Lord. David heard the Lord say, my son, I am with you. I will guide you. Be in my presence. I am coming soon. Trust in me. I love you. I am coming very soon. Be in my presence. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. And the last word or the second word today which Messiah wanted us to share, Messiah wanted David to share, was on the third day of the seventh month of this month of this year, of course, 2019. This was once again during David was spending time with the Lord in the evening. David heard the Lord say, My son. I am with you. I will guide you. I love you very much. Be in my presence. Trust in me. Be in my word. Trust in my word. And I am coming very soon. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Dear brothers and sisters, Messiah says, I am coming very soon. We might have been hearing this for years, months, years, decades. Are we tired of hearing it, dear brothers and sisters? But Messiah is not tired of telling us that, that I'm coming very soon. Oftentimes we start demanding that how soon is this soon? You need to tell me the time and things alike. That's where we get into the dark areas which Satan tries to push us and deceive us through whatsoever means that be, dear brothers and sisters. Let us trust him at his word today. As a matter of fact, David has a message for us. The Lord is leading him to talk about the Beatitudes once again. The way David does his message, dear brothers and sisters, that he, during the week, he prepares for the message. And then he records it on a voice recorder. And typically, my wife, his mother, will be typing it up, typing it up. And then I go through that once to see the, to see the typos and grammatical errors, typically. And then we print it out. So that's... But it is solely led by the Spirit of God. Once again, we do hope, dear brothers and sisters, that this message encourages each one of us. As I was going through that, it's a staggering message. Indeed, indeed, this message ministered. My wife also was telling that while she was typing it up, that it's indeed, it indeed ministered her and it ministered me, dear brothers and sisters. We hope that it blesses each one of us equally. Once again, let's pay heed to what Messiah's let God's word speak to us, not our thoughts, not our determination, not all the things around horizontally. Let's look up. Let's look at the supernatural power of God's word and let's understand the supernatural power of the spirit of God. So let's once again receive the message what God has for us, dear brothers and sisters, so that his purpose be accomplished through each one of us during this time. And you can please go ahead, David. So today, Lord Jesus Christ is telling us once again that he is coming very soon and extremely soon to take us home. And while we wait, Lord Jesus Christ is telling all of us to be in his presence and be ready. Today, the Lord is leading me to talk about the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are the blessings which God has pronounced on true born again 
believers. He tells us how to be blessed, and then he tells us what the blessing is. The Beatitudes are recorded in Luke 6 and in Matthew 5. In Luke 6, there are four blessings and four woes. In Matthew 5, there are eight Beatitudes. In Luke 6, there are physical aspects of the Beatitudes. And in Matthew 5, there are spiritual aspects of the Beatitudes. In Luke, we see verse 20 is contrasted with verse 24. Verse 21 is contrasted with verse 25. And verse 22 is contrasted with verse 26. It talks about the present and future tense, both in Luke and Matthew. Luke 6 says, Blessed are you poor, which is contrasted with Woe to you who are rich in the present tense. The future tense is, for yours is the kingdom of God. And for the rich people, for you have received your consolation. Which means that there will be no more consolation. And the present tense for the hungry is, blessed are those who hunger. And, you, and the future for the hungry will be that they will be full. The future for those who are full is that they will be hungry. Likewise, the future of those who weep now is laughing. And the future of those who will laugh now is mourning. Also, the future of the persecuted is that they will rejoice. And the future for the other people the people of whom others speak good things now are doomed. That is what happens to false prophets. That is what Christ says in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. So let us understand one thing about the Beatitudes. The word Beatitude comes from two root words. The first word is attitude, and the second word is be. The word be attitude means the attitude which we need to be. We need to notice the word be. It's not do attitude, but it's be attitude. That we need to be and not do. That is what the beatitudes explain us. As we see from the scriptures. Coming back to the Beatitudes, as we talked about in Matthew 5. What Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew's account is spiritual, and it is very staggering. So we are looking at Matthew 5, and there are about 8 Beatitudes. And if Christ himself says that we are blessed, then who can nullify it? So here we see... And who and what can bless us? Coming to order the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. They are recorded in Matthew 5, 3 through 10. We will be going Beatitude by Beatitude. The first Beatitude is recorded in verse 3, which says, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for theirs, poor in spirit, excuse me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So let us dwell on that verse. The Greek word used here for poor is tukos, which means not a loss of spirit, but spiritually poor. The Greek word for spirit used here is pneumatikos, which, which means spiritually. So in verse 3, tukos, pneumatikos, means spiritually poor, needy, or beggar. And the Bible says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word for kingdom is basilia, which tells us that the kingdom of God is the sphere of God's rule. The kingdom of God is glorious. The kingdom of God is for the people who are truly born again. That is what his disciples prayed for in our Lord's Prayer. And we also pray that thy kingdom come. 
Lord Jesus Christ is the King. Coming to the second beatitude as recorded in verse 4, which says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now let us talk about that. So what is mourning? In Luke's account, it is weeping. We can also call it as crying. This crying has taken in two ways our classes. First is crying out to God, and second is mourning over our sins. Crying out to the Lord is when we feel the heaviness of the cross, and tears flow down, and we feel the love for the Lord inside as they flow. That is crying out to the Lord. Also, it can be mourning for our sins. That means the heaviness of, of our sins as it happened for Christ in Gethsemane. Feeling the heaviness of sin. Those were our sins, each one of our sins. Lord Jesus Christ was perfect and sinless, and yet he took the sins of the entire world and felt the heaviness of those sins. Today is the day to get on our knees and cry out to God and mourn for our sin. Another kind of crying is a bad kind of crying which is for the lost fortune or weeping for lost fortune. That is worldly. Coming to the next beatitude, as Matthew records in verse 5, it is the third beatitude which says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Inheriting the earth is not having all the good things and the money and the luxury from the earth. This is going to happen in the millennium. One Lord Jesus Christ rules as the king from the throne of David. This is not this earth. We have to look at the spiritual aspect. Meekness is humility. Meekness doesn't come by weakness. And meekness is not weakness. We need God to give us strength to be meek. Selflessness stems from meekness. Meekness is the fruit of the Spirit, the eighth fruit of the Spirit. On the other hand is pride. We all need to have patience and meekness. Meekness is the key. So what is the next beatitude? It is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So who is righteous? God is the only righteous one. Also, what should we hunger and thirst for? Let us dwell a little more on the fourth beatitude. Also, we need to remember that the fourth beatitude doesn't say that blessed are those who are righteous, but it says that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Which means we don't always have to be perfect. So what is being hungry? Seeking food. What does being thirsty mean? Seeking water. We need to seek the righteous food, which is basically spiritual food, the word of God. We need to seek the fountain of living water, which is the righteous water, which is the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. We all need to seek the righteous one, not just today. Not just tomorrow, but every single day. Till the day of rapture, we need to seek the righteous one. And who is the righteous one? I repeat, he is Lord Jesus Christ. What is the next beatitude? It is, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 
It doesn't say, blessed are the mighty. It says, blessed are the merciful. We need to love one another with agape love. The love which comes from God and Him alone. We need to have mercy for one another. Might won't always last. Anger will fail, but God's agape love will last. Mercy will last. But this love or mercy shouldn't stem from our flesh. Otherwise, it will be very shallow and soon come to an end. It should be God's agape love and God's mercy because God's mercies are new every morning as we see in Lamentations 3.22. Let us talk about the next three Beatitudes. The sixth, the seventh, and the eighth Beatitude. Verses 8 through 10 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The sixth, seventh, and the eighth beatitude are the three P's, the scriptural blessing which we need to seek, empowered by the Spirit of God. Excuse me. This pure in heart, which we see here, doesn't include rituals like washing hands with soap, like brushing or taking bath. This is not what is being pure. This pure is not physically pure. It is spiritually pure. It's pure in heart. This is not the only place the scripture talks about pure. The psalmist says in Psalm 51.10 about pure. King David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. The Hebrew word for clean here is takor, which means pure. Heart used here in Matthew 5, 8 means inner being. So this is basically pure, which is the clean or pure in our relationship with God. The inner being, the heart, which is basically speaking of the inner core of our being. And that is the meaning of the Greek word used here. This doesn't, this does reflect, excuse me. What Messiah told in the Gospels. As Mark records in Mark 11, in Mark 12, 30, excuse me. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Getting to the peacemakers as mentioned in verse 9. Which are those who settle arguments and fights. And that is the meaning of peacemaker, those who make peace among the brethren. And most importantly, making peace between men and God. They shall be called sons of God. Let us talk about what is a son. Who is a son? The true son. The son of God. Those who make peace. Romans 5.1 tells us, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God is the greatest relationship, as we see in the superlatives of John 3.16. So those are peacemakers. Now getting to the last beatitude, which is the persecuted, as recorded in verse 10, the eighth beatitude. Being persecuted should not be doing, should not be for doing wrong things. Excuse me. We should endure it patiently, of course, 
but it should be false accusation, and that should be your perse persecution. Excuse me. It shouldn't be for doing wrong things. Persecution can be being accused, as Peter records in First Peter four twelve through sixteen, which says, "Beloved." Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as a busy body in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So today as we end, Taking it to our homiletics, we all need to understand that the Beatitudes are not two attitudes. It is nothing about doing from our flesh. It is about Beatitude. It is not about do, but be. It is not what we do, but how we yield to the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us moment by moment. These are the scriptural blessings as pronounced in the scriptures. Are we going to seek them today? Are you going to seek them? Lord Jesus Christ is coming very, very soon. Please be in his presence and let us seek these scriptural blessings. Thank you everybody and me. Lord Jesus Christ bless you all in abundance. Amen. <coughs> and amen. amen. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much once again, David, for sharing about the Beatitudes, dear brothers and sisters. Hopefully that was audible enough with all the background noise. We do apologize once again, dear brothers and sisters, because of all the limited equipment facility. But dear brothers and sisters, the point is once again, it's when we hear about the Beatitudes, doesn't it every time? When we hear about the Beatitude, does it not leave an impression in us? It's like we feel that peace somewhere. It's like when we hear, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What is our first impression when we hear that, dear brothers and sisters? That blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do we start jumping into conclusions, take out some scriptures, handful of scriptures, and we try to prove, no, this purity has nothing to do with it. This is not, the teaching is not for us. This was for the Jews. This is not, this is otherwise legalism and all the different aspects. Then we miss out, as today David was pointing out, as I was reading what the Lord led him to speak about, I realized one thing, dear brothers and sisters, that these are scriptural blessings which are explicitly pronounced for every true born-again believer. Today, Satan has somehow introduced all the means and mechanisms so that we don't, we are not able to receive it tangibly. We are not able to get that peace when we hear, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All across the Bible we see that. That God 
Isaiah 57, 15, I believe, tells us the same thing that he who dwelleth, inhabiteth eternity, also dwells with the broken and contrite spirit. We can't imagine what that means, dear brothers and sisters. We can't imagine, truly we cannot imagine that Lord God Almighty dwells with the broken and contrite spirit. Can we imagine, dear brothers and sisters, today is the day once again to understand, as David told us, that these are not do, nothing to do. These are be attitudes, not do attitudes. It's the spirit of God, the one who has begun a good work in each one of us, is the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, which enables us to receive these blessings. This has nothing to nothing. To do with do, do, do and do. This has nothing to do with all the works and law law versus grace debate. Dear brothers and sisters, let's get out of it. Let's receive, get in that peace where we, when we hear Messiah, those red words. There is a peace which surpasses all understanding which covers us. Let's be there today. Let's get there today. Because our Lord... Is an awesome God. He wants to speak to our hearts, dear brothers and sisters. But we don't give him a chance. As a matter of fact, today let's pick up on our first Peter chapter 2. I believe last time we did verses 9 and 10. Today the Lord is leading us to talk about how we can glorify God and how exactly we can be fruit bearing in these end of the end moments because that's where we are. Dear brothers and sisters, we find so many distractions, so many divisions, and so many different things. This is the time, dear brothers and sisters, to anchor ourselves in the Word of God. This is the time to spend more time in our prayer closet. This is the time to shun the evil, to shun the enemy, to rebuke the enemy, using our authority of Luke 10, 19 in Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach's mighty name today is the day and today is the day to use the word of god like messiah used to say it is written it is written it is written satan you're a liar you had been a liar from the beginning when you speak lies you are talking in your native tongue you are a murderer that's what john 8 teaches us doesn't it so today is the day so let's jump in first peter chapter 2 Probably we will have enough time, hopefully, for verses 11 and 12. So verses 9 and 10, we last time saw verses 9 and 10. I believe that was last two sessions, actually, we got to do one verse each. So it was where Peter says, but you are a chosen generation. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, if you're joining us for the first time, the Lord has led us to do the study in the book of First Peter, which is about the sanctification of every true born again believer. That's what Peter talks about. So we have been, as the Lord is leading us, we have been doing this for Anna and David when they share the urgent word. Whatever time we have during that time, we pick up on First Peter. So we are in First Peter chapter two. We complete it till verse ten and verses nine and tell ten. Excuse me, verses nine and ten. Peter says, "But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light." Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And then Peter continues. And then Peter continues and says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners that sojourners and pilgrims abstain, abstain from fleshly lusts. Which war against the soul. And in verse 12 he says. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. That when they speak against you as evil doers. They may by your good works. Which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. There is a whole lot going on dear brothers and sisters. So first thing is strangers. Strangers. Peter is telling beloved. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, as strangers. In the KJV version it says, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. The word strangers, dear brothers and sisters, the Greek word here is peroikos. Peroikos. Those who are loved by God are exhorted to live as strangers. Those who live in a place 
that is not their home. That is the meaning of the Greek word perikos, which Peter is using here. And it is used figuratively of every true born again believer of Christians here, whose real home is heaven. We are to live as pilgrims and strangers in the world from Genesis 23, 4, Psalm 39, 12, Hebrews 11, 9, Hebrews 11, 13, 1 Peter 1, 17. Then all across the scriptures, it tells us the same thing over and over again to be as strangers, to be as pilgrims, to be as sojourners. Your brothers and sisters, no one is really a pilgrim. In this biblical sense, who has not first become a stranger to this world? Just as their Christian values and beliefs are rejected by the world, so they are to live apart from the immorality and sinful desires that surround them. And that's exactly what Peter is telling us. Abstain. Abstain. The Greek word is apekestai. Apachestai, apachestai, as a matter of fact, sorry if I am not able to get the pronunciation correct, but I believe it's apachestai. That's the Greek word abstain, which means it's the Greek word used there is literally to hold oneself constantly back from. Every true born again believer, Christians are to resist the sinward pull of those worldly desires which war against their spiritual lives. In this real spiritual battle, a demonic strategy is to attack believers at their weakest points, dear brothers and sisters. And oftentimes we don't realize this battle. And we can only abstain from... Fleshly lust, apachasthai, abstain from the fleshly lust as we live as sojourners and pilgrims. As those who recognize that this world is not their home and that they have a home and a citizenship in heaven. We need to understand that because Peter says which war against the soul. This war is an everyday war till the day of rapture. Until we die as true born again believers, we are at war. The war is flesh versus spirit. It's not about inadequacy and insufficiency of the flesh. It's about gratifying the flesh. That's the war. Let's not get it wrong, dear brothers and sisters. Peter here understands that these fleshly lusts war against the soul. To be a true born again believer, to be Christian, to bear the name of Christ means to fight against the lusts of flesh. And the battle continues as long as we live. And then Peter says in verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. So now we are a holy nation. Now we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his own special people. So that's why being his own special people, although we once were Gentiles in darkness, now we are his special people. Now we are not labeled as Jews, Greeks or Gentiles or anything, but as God's special people, his chosen people. Some versions of the Bible, as a matter of fact, says peculiar people. Are we his peculiar people? Then our habit should be peculiar that we don't belong to the world. When the entire world is going tech savvy. We should be praying that Lord take me out of it. When the entire world is going crazy about that new smartphone release. Then we should be praying about it. Abstain. Apachasthai, abstain. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may be, they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's a responsibility of being a royal. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, as good as it sounds to gratify our flesh, that comes with that responsibility. So here, Peter, after the negative exhort exhortation of verse 11, is now followed in verse 12 by the positive instruction. 
Christians are to abstain from sinful desires not only for their own spiritual well-being but also in order to maintain an effective testimony before unbelievers because a positive true born again lifestyle is a powerful means of convicting the world of its sin we are called to be the light and the salt of the earth because the unbelieving world the truth today dear brothers and sisters is tired they are tired of hearing professing believers talking so much about the cross and everything and the gospel and when they look at their lifestyle and their life at best they will perhaps match up 75% to that to that heathen life to that unbelievers life we claim about supernatural powers of the cross and of our Savior and Messiah. But our life does not demonstrate that. We crave for the very same thing which an unbeliever, a heathen, a pagan craves for. How are we the royal priesthood? His own special people does not crave for fleshly things, right? That's what is the problem. That's what Peter is telling us today. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. This kind of godly living makes our conduct honorable among those who don't know God yet. Dear brothers and sisters, the problem is we don't quite understand the battle between the flesh and the spirit. So Peter, as a matter of fact, Peter uses this word good here, which is kalos. Kalos, twice he uses that in this verse, kalos. To define both Christian lives, conversations and their works. Before the critical eyes of the slanderous people and their false accusations, the good deeds of believers can glorify God and win others to believe that God, Lord God Almighty, that the cross of Calvary indeed has supernatural powers. The same person who was in the world, who was loving the world, who was doing all worldly things, all of a sudden the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth has covered him or her and all of a sudden he Although he's in this world or she's in this world, that something has happened now. Now he or she does not have those desires and she's fighting against them. Not pretending to fight, not hypocrisy, but truly struggling and fighting, fighting the good fight. And in only his, Messiah's might, this fight happens. And then Peter says, in the day of his visitation. That, as a matter of fact, that Greek word is, I believe, in the day of visitation is enhymera episcopes. Enhymera episcopes. In the day of his visitation, the time of Messiah's visitation, perhaps it's once again looking towards Messiah's return. So dear brothers and sisters, today as a matter of fact, let's real quick take a look. This fleshly lust, we are talking about the spiritual battle. What exactly is the spiritual battle? The fight between the spirit and flesh. As a matter of fact, when you read the scriptures, dear brothers and sisters, I'm sure that probably the Lord is leading you to do that. But if you are not, dear brothers and sisters, have you been digging on those cross references every time you go read perhaps there are several ways to read the scriptures of course we read the scriptures we first need to invite the spirit of god we need to make, ensure that we pray lord fill me with your holy spirit and please open your word to my hearts and lives through your spirit lord and teach me lord because john 16 13 says that the spirit of god when he comes he will teach me you lead me into all truth. So show me all the truth and teach me, Lord, and lead me in the scriptures today. What you have in the name, holy name of Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, my God, I pray this. Something similar to that. If you pray and say amen. And once you open, so one way of looking at this, just read through the passage. Maybe take five or five verses, seven verses, depending on your time frame. And then 
later revisit that and take a look at the cross references the cross references which the scriptures had so verses 11 and 12 I tried to pull out some of the first Peter chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 I tried to put out pull up some of the cross references and it's indeed staggering dear brothers and sisters let's take a quick look together so Peter talks about what beloved I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims are abstain from fleshly lusts and there we see there are some cross references so let's take a look at that one of them was Romans chapter 8 these are just scriptures dear brothers and sisters let's try and understand what exactly is this fleshly lust week the scripture has all the answers we don't have to google it we don't have to go to extra biblical resources bible scholars bible teachers notes and all those things we don't have to do all that bible has all the answers second timothy chapter 3 16 and 17 tells us that the word of god is sufficient and it equips us for all good work we don't need anybody dear brothers and sisters that's the truth because that's god's word tells us and in these end moments the decision is ours dear brothers and sisters are we going to stand absolutely on the word of god or are we going to have this form of godliness using few scriptures here and there and then some more from bible scholars bible teachers and time watchers whatsoever it is that choice is ours are we going to is the bible the word of god or absolute of authority or not because if it is not if then we have we have opinions conjectures and speculations that open dim, that can open demonic doors beyond our imagination dear brothers and sisters the battle of flesh and spirit is a serious battle we need to understand this battle this is not about fleshly inadequacies and insufficiencies this is not about only emotional heartbreaks this is not only about every our ailments it has more much much more to it so Romans 8, 12 through 14, let's read some scriptures together, dear brothers and sisters. Let the word of God speak to you because nobody is speaking will hold water. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 tells us it is only God's word. It is only God's word which won't come back void. Every motivational speeches, every good orator, speakers and all whatever social psychological gospels all adrenaline stimulating speeches all those things is not going to cut it it's not going to hold water but one thing will the inherent word of god so let's today once again take a look at it romans 8 12 through 14 tells us therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put death put to death the deeds of the body you will live for as many as are led by the spirit of god these are sons of god hopefully that speaks to us dear brothers and sisters the next reference was and once again because of the inexhaustibly once again of the scriptures of the subject matter what law leads us to speak and the, and the time we have once again, we will run through the scriptures real quick. Please make a note of it. We highly implore you. Please pray over and dwell in these scriptures for the coming weeks. If you are making a note of it, please, dear brothers and sisters, please once again make a note of it. Romans chapter 8 verses 12 through 14 is what we read. Next, let's go to Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 18. It says, I say then, Paul says, I say then, walk in the spirit. Oh, this is Paul telling, he will say walk in the spirit, but he was 2,000 years ago. I don't have to do that. It's, it's now just euphemism. That's why 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is that every word is God breathed. These are not Paul's suggestions or opinion. Every word is God breathed. Theopinustus. Every word is God breathed. Theos is God and Numa is breath. Theopinustus, that's the Greek word. So it says Galatians 5, 16 through 18. And I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God gives us the answers. He does not hang us only with questions and conjectures and speculations and debateful mind and all those contentions and things alike. He gives us the answers and he will help us do it. 
And Paul continues, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. That should tell us a lot. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. That should put us, put all the debates. First of all, all this debate and contention is of the flesh. The ones who are coming and talking about grace. We are under the law because if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, then you won't be having all debates and contentions. Proverbs chapter 13 tells us that all these contentions, the root of all contentions and all these debates is what? Pride. Please do check it out. I believe Proverbs 13, 10. And that's if I recall. It's Proverbs 13, 10 tells us that. So once again, if the word of God be followed strictly, so many things will shed off. So many things we can shred, dear brothers and sisters. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If I'm led by the Spirit, I won't come every day and talk about grace and law debate. I will start starting one, one opposition and, and then start use some opposition as the punching bag and start. Then I'm not walk, then I'm not in the Spirit. That's a fleshly activity. Proverbs 13, 10 tells us that. And if I am in the flesh, then I am under the law. Now we see the oxymoron here. The ones who come and talk about the, gra the grace, they are actually under the law and talking things. And that's not my conjecture. Please don't get us wrong, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, as the law leaves, we speak, dear brothers and sisters. Please be active, be real. Please do check it out once again. Because that's what it is. The truth, once again, is the word of God. There is no sugar coating in the word of God. What good it does to anybody, dear brothers and sisters, when we come and water down the gospel and say this and that, but not what exactly Messiah says, dear brothers and sisters. I would rather be a doorkeeper in my Messiah's house speaking what he wants me to say rather than dwelling in the tent of the wicked. And that's not cliche. That's not a cliche, dear brothers and sisters. Really, as the Messiah is leading, I am speaking, we are speaking our heart out. That's the truth, dear brothers and sisters. Because even one soul, even if one soul, because this is all, once again, after that one lost sheep, even that one lost sheep which Messiah is trying to reach and he will. Is done through filthy people like us. It's worth it. God be glorified at all times. Romans 8 1 tells us. This is the verse we all know but we don't read it entirely. If we don't pick up our Bibles why will we not be deceived dear brothers and sisters. Romans 8 1 there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus it doesn't stop there it says who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit hopefully once again we are getting a perspective today with the time frame we have about the flesh versus spirit dear brothers and sisters that's the battle hopefully these scriptures the spirit of God is speaking to us today dear brothers and sisters don't Listen to what I am telling or David is telling on, or what we are telling in this channel. Please fix your eyes on the word of God. Let the supernatural power, the Ruach HaKodesh, the author himself, the spirit of God speak to your heart. That's what it's all about. It, is, it was always about that. It is about it and it will always be. Galatians 6, 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life and these are just from the cross references of first peter chapter 2 we are talking about the fleshly lusts when we dig through navigate through those ref cross references these are the ones this is not we don't have to spend a whole 
bunch of time for this. We just have to note those down and go to those scriptures and let the Spirit of God speak to us. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. This I say, therefore, and testify in the law that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness. Jude 1 3 has a lot to talk about lewdness and how the grace of God can be converted to lewdness. That's another day perhaps. But here Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19 Paul says to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now the contrast but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Dear brothers and sisters, these are scriptures. Please let the spirit of God speak to your heart. The next one was Colossians 3, 5 through 10 and this is once again understanding what are these fleshly lusts and how what is the battle about the flesh and spirit Colossians 3 5 through 10 therefore put to death your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry something very important to note once again we are rushing through these scriptures but what very important to note is passion is told as idolatry have you noticed that some Times we think passion is a good thing, but not so because Paul is telling it is not. Passion is an idolatry. So because verse 6, he continues, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. It's, it's always past tense. The old has passed away, the new has come. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. And then Peter says that having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. So there we having your conduct honorable. There we see some more cross references. There we see Philippians 2, 12 through 16. That something is a battlefield. Let's read that with the time we have. Hopefully the spirit of God will speak to us. So Paul says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your sal own salvation with fear and trembling let's not stop there let's not stop there and create a battlefield unnecessarily first of all let's understand the preposition there it's not work for your salvation it is work out your own salvation let's pay heed to that word work out your own salvation not work for your salvation nobody can work for their salvation it is blasphemy and it is utter blasphemy because everything has been paid underscored in the cross of calvary ephesians 2 1 to 10 every day if you're reading that should Clear of all the fog that how we can be saved because we were dead in our trespasses and nobody can make a dead person alive except the, in him and only in him we have redemption through his precious blood. Only there is forgiveness of sins. There is nothing. So let us not go on that tangential trip which leads us not to fruit bearing anymore. Because we will look at the fruit bearing with the given time. Today we might be a little over time. But please stay with us. If time is your limiting factor. Once again do it in parts. Let the spirit of God speak to your heart. Let there be a zeal to pursue Christ. No matter what. Till my last breath I will pursue Christ. If I am the last person standing on planet earth. I will still serve Christ. Christ, not through my power or might or intellect, but through his spirit. Though he may slay me, yet, yet I will trust him. Today is the day. Today is the day to come to Christ. Not get into scriptural, unnecessary scriptural debates without taking, reading that scripture and without taking all those scripture out of context. So let's read that. So Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
Then he continues, for. It is continuing, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his, do for his good pleasure. Dear brothers and sisters, that should shred every form of debate and contention. Paul is telling, walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then that sentence is connected by for. That for is very important. That conjunction there, for, is very important. Dear brothers and sisters, when we are not paying heed, precision is the key once again. For it is God who works in you both to will and do for his own good pleasure. So we see it is God who is working, not us. We are yielding to the spirit of God. So there is no confusion there. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among you, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That is our call to be the light of the world. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice on the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Same Matthew 5 16 tells us about the same thing. Let your life so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. And these, this is the same thing what Peter was trying to tell us. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers that they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. 1 Peter 4.11 talks about the same thing. 1 Peter 4.11 talks about the same thing. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability with which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever first peter 4 16 tells us the same thing if anyone suffers as a christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify god in this matter when we suffer god has been glorified how to glorify god how to glorify god dear brothers and sisters the scripture is telling us we may have so many different fleshly thoughts and goals and things alike but when we suffer for him and that's what once again david was trying to tell us suffer Suffering not for our fleshly wrongdoings, but suffering for what God has ordained. First Peter 2, two chapter 2, verses 20 and 21 tells us that is our calling. We are called to suffer. Something which we don't get, but get to hear much. But suffering is to glorify God. Can you imagine that by our suffering we are glorifying God? What a different, what a perspective it is. How much easier our suffering will be, dear brothers and sisters, when we realize that this puny man, this tiny man, this speck of dust can actually glorify God through whatever suffering I'm going right this moment. Then so be it. Crush me, Lord, so that you be glorified. But give me the grace, empowering grace enough. Don't take the suffering away. Help me to glorify you through your grace, empowering grace. You said my grace is sufficient for thee, for Paul. And he said, I will boast all the more in, our inf in my infirmities, in my weaknesses, because in my weaknesses, I am made strong. The next way to glorify John 15, 8, by this my father is glorified. There you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So today, let's take a in the time that remains. Let's take a look at this good works. That's what is causing a minefield of confusion. Satan has spread out here, brothers and sisters. Let's take a quick look at the good works. Hopefully that will give us a perspective. We can use this as a springboard once again to do our own study. These good works has nothing to do with being saved. This is the fruit of being saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 tells us that for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself but is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We know this by heart. That by Now we know this by heart because this has been propagated like anything. But then verse 10 we hear it sometimes, but some part of it is missing. Let's point out and take a look at what is missing and how is it important. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, poema, that's the Greek word, that we are his poem. That's, that's quite a statement. We are God's poem. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
So he has already preordained, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's something which we are not hearing, that we should walk in them. If I am saved, I should walk in them. How do I do it? The sanctification ministry of the Holy Spirit does it. I have to do nothing. There is no doing. That's what is a religion. Do, 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 do. But Christ, his precious priceless blood says done, done, done. Now just obey and walk in it. We need to understand this difference between do and done. First Thessalonians 4, 3 tells us, dear brothers and sisters, for this is the will of God. What is the will of God? For this is the will of God, your sanctification, dear brothers and sisters. God will never justify the justification through the precious blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, which takes place. God will never justify anybody whom he will not sanctify. Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work, that is the sanctification work. He will complete it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This will give us a perspective, hopefully. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. Now let's pay heed to what Paul is telling. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. How can we do the good work again, which God has preordained? We must walk in them. Ephesians 2, 10, we saw that. This is the will of God, which is sanctification, doing those good works, not through our power or might or intellect, but through the sanctification ministry of the dwelling Holy Spirit. And how does that happen? All scripture, through all scripture, what happens? We are thoroughly equipped for every good work. If we don't dig deeper in the scriptures, how are we going to do those good works which God has saved us for, dear brothers and sisters? Titus 1.16 tells us they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is, Tit what is Paul telling to Titus? They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable disobedient and disqualified for every good work so when we hear someone telling i don't know about you but i want to glorify god that's not always true that's what the scripture is telling my natural desire is not to glorify god i was brought forth in iniquity when i walk in the spirit when i yield to the spirit the spirit of god supernaturally makes me glorify God that has nothing to do with me it's the spirit man because there is nothing good which dwells in me or any one of us so we see there are two kinds of Christians now professing and practicing Titus 1 16 please do your own study they profess to know God but in works they deny him so everyone who profess to know God, they don't naturally, I don't know about you, but I want to glorify God. That's a cliche. They profess to know God, but in the works they deny Him. That's not my word. Titus 1, 16, Paul is telling us, are we paying heed to it? Or are we now becoming uncomfortable, shutting down the video, giving a thumbs down if you are? Our dear fellow brethren, it's our prayer that please pay heed. Please read Titus 1.16. Please, please let the Spirit of God speak to you. And eternity is a long time. We can let, let us set aside our flesh. Let Messiah's will be done. It was a very heavy price paid on Calvary. Let's not get into the satanic whatever satanic deception God is bigger than everything he will set each one of us free he will please pray over if the Lord leaves please contact us let's pray together let's read the scriptures together let's discuss and let the word of God enlighten us let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts we not Bible scholars, teachers on this channel or anybody, but God himself. Because his word says they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable, disobedient and disqualified for every good work. 
Titus 2, 11 through 14, we have heard about God's grace. What is the function of God's grace? What does it do? Is it just a head knowledge which just sits in the upper compartment? Which just sits in our brain doing nothing? Which just, we just don't know what exactly it is. No, not so. Titus 2, 11 through 14 tells us. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Let's pay heed to it. Teaching us that. So grace of God teaches us something. Grace of God teaches us something. What is it? It's not debating. It's not contention. It's not about all the fleshly things. But it teaches us something totally antagonistic. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age, not after rapture. That is the grace of God, functional grace of God. If I come and tell my family that I went out and I got a hair, I just got a haircut and came and then they see no, they, nothing. You don't look any different and I will just say no, this is a delusional haircut. You have to believe it. You have to look at me and believe that the, all the hair is gone. That's not how it works, dear brothers and sisters. I'm being facetious. It's a clumsy example. Hopefully, once again, we can put the point across. The grace of God rattles when we shake it. It's not delusional grace. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. The dome of Yeshua HaMashiach, the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth has set you and me free. And if the Son has set us free, we are free indeed. How are we free if we are once again bonded, being bond servants of our flesh? How are we? Free. Are we slaves of righteousness or of sin? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that in I ungodliness and worldliness, we worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of a great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That's a very popular scripture, but we don't take it in context. Verse 14 says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Are we zealous for good works? Your brothers and sisters, once again, we highly implore when you hear some scriptures, whatever, wherever you're hearing, if you're hearing some scriptures, if it is not, you're not feeling that not in your stomach, uncomfortable. If you're feeling very comfortable, then your flesh is not being confronted. Holy Spirit is not convicting you. Then we highly recommend you one thing, dear brothers and sisters, whatever scripture you're hearing, please go look in your Bible, five verses above it and five verses below it. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. He does speak. God is alive. The garden tomb is empty. If it is not, then everything is a lie. And that's not what it is. If grace is just a head concept, then our God is still in that garden tomb. He is not risen and everything what God said, His promises has failed. Nothing in the Bible rattles. It's just a head knowledge like other religious, heathens, religious books and that's it. But that's not true because the garden tomb is empty and we, me and my family and I'm sure so many of our fellow brethren listening now, you can say amen, that Jesus Christ is alive. I can lift, raise my hand and I can testify of that. If he was not alive, I wouldn't have been alive. I wouldn't have been set free. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 tells us, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen, amen and amen. Dear brothers and sisters, 
when we look at, we are probably running out of time, but when we look at every letter to the, to the churches, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, what does Messiah say? I know thy works. Strange phrase. As a matter of fact, we highly implore you. Let's real quick, as a matter of fact, take a real quick tour of the seven letters. What exactly it is, dear brothers and sisters? Seven letters, the staggering, staggering letters. It's authored by Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ, personally. And for many reasons, these seven letters, which comprises chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, are probably the most important part of this book for you and me. Why these seven letters? Have you ever questioned, dear brothers and sisters? There, are many, there were many other churches at that time that would seem to be more historically significant than the seven that Messiah addressed. What about the churches at Jerusalem, Rome, Galatia, Corinth, Antioch, Colossae, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, Miletus, to name a few. What about that? Why not those? Why did Messiah select just these seven? Ephesus, Mona, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. That in itself is a study, dear brothers and sisters. When we read the churches, there are four levels. Please do your own study today. Hopefully, please do bear with us. We'll be a little extra over time today. But the churches have four levels of meaning. There appear to be these four levels of application, at least in these letters. One is the local. One is the local. What does, what does that mean? That these were actual historic churches with valid needs. And archaeological discoveries have confirmed this. The second level is admonitory. Admonitory, what does it mean? In each of the letters, there appears the key phrase. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Churches. Not the plural, dear brothers and sisters. Churches. It turns out that each of the letters applies to all churches throughout history. As we understand the sevenfold internal structure. The uniquely tailored messages and the specific admonitions in each of the letters. We discover that any church can be mapped in terms of these seven composite profiles. The third level is homiletic. Homiletic. Each of the letters also contains the phrase, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Let's lift up our hands. And let's check. Do you, do we, do me, do I have an ear? And once again, I'm being facetious. Each one of us have an ear, right, dear brothers and sisters? So each letter applies to each one of us. That's the homiletic personal application. There are some elements of each of these seven churches in each one of us. Thus, this may be perhaps the most practical application of the entire book of Revelation for you and me. And the fourth level is, of course, the prophetic, which we are studying about it, the most amazing discovery of these seven le letters is their apparent prophetic application, of course. And these letters describe with remarkable precision the unfolding of all subsequent church history. Dear brothers and sisters, these letters describe with remarkable precision what's going to happen. If these letters were in any other order, this would not be true. These letters appear, as a matter of fact, to fill the interval between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel 9. If we look up in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, one of the most staggering scriptures of the entire Holy Bible. We can spend months studying that, as a matter of fact. Dear brothers and sisters, the book of Acts covers about 30 years, but these two chapters of the book covers about approximately 2,000 years now. And coming to the seven key elements of, the, of every church, a key aspect to understanding these letters is to grasp the structure. If we don't understand the structure and the design of these letters, we won't. A careful examination of the letter will reveal the seven components, seven elements, key elements in their design. First is the meaning of the name of the church being addressed. Then the title, second is the title of Messiah, each chosen relevant to the message to that particular church. Third is the com commendation of things that have been done well. Fourth is the criticism of things that need attention. Fifth is the exhortation, the exhortation specific to the condition of the particular church. 
Sixth is the promise to the overcomer included with each letter. And then the seventh, which is the key phrase, which we all know. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. That's the key to understand, dear brothers and sisters. He who has an ear, let him hear. If we see, as a matter of fact, the meaning of the names of the churches, it's staggering. The church of Ephesus is the desired one. The church of Smona is the myrrh, which means death. The church of Porgamos means mixed marriage. The church of Thyatira is the meaning is Semiramis. The church of Sardis is remnant. Church of Philadelphia is brotherly love. And church of Laodicea is, of course, people rule. Dear brothers and sisters, it is also interesting that this key phrase, this key phrase in the element 7, which is, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the churches, is the final element in the last four letters, but appears before the promise to the overcomer, which is the sixth point which we look, took a look, in the first three churches, in Ephesus, Pona, and Pergamos, leaving the promises as a kind of postscript after the body of the letter themselves and once again we are running out of time dear brothers and sisters if if you are once again please do your own study if you're interested as a matter of fact the lord led us to put up a study a while back we'll leave the link in our description box it's a staggering study of the seven churches led by dr chuck missler late dr late dr chuck missler and his staggering study dear brothers and sisters please if the lord leads you go for it it will be staggering. It will be beyond imagination rewarding, dear brothers and sisters. And that's not just telling. Please do your own study and see how it is. Let the Spirit of God speak to you, dear brothers and sisters. It's Once again, these churches have so much more to it. There is perhaps intended some parallel between these seven letters of Messiah and his kingdom parables of Matthew 13. There are seven kingdom parables. The first seven kingdom parables in Matthew 13 has a parable to these seven churches. That is, again, another staggering study. What about, what about Paul's letters? It is interesting when we see that Paul in the New Testament signed 13 epistles. But three of these had duplicate addresses. The, the Corinth and Thessalonians and Timothy, we, have, we see duplicate, right? There are 2 Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians and 2 Timothy. So this makes 10 addresses. But there are three addresses which were individuals, which were pastoral epistles to Titus, Timothy and Philemon. So 10 minus 3, what is it? 7. So we see Paul wrote to seven churches. Is there a possible parallel between the seven churches Paul wrote and the seven that Messiah addressed in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, dear brothers and sisters? Today we won't have time to go in that detail, but if the Lord leads, once again we will leave the link. For the study which the Lord led us to put a, a while back. Please do your own study. Come to your own conclusions dear brothers and sisters. The point is in those churches. Messiah says I know thy works. Have you realized dear brothers and sisters. Lately this works concept has been so much. So much under attack. Every kind of work is perhaps working towards salvation. Not so. Not so. Works never saved anybody and will never ever save anybody. Period. Let's move on. But if we are saved by the precious, priceless, holy blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, it is God who does those good works in you and me, which is already predestined and we should walk according to them. That's the scriptures we read. That is the sanctification work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 tells us that sanctification is the will of God for every true born again believer. It is not optional. God does not justify anybody through the cross of Calvary whom he won't sanctify through the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. And that is what exactly the first 15 verses of Romans chapter 8 is about. Galatians chapter 5 is about. The entire book of 1 Peter is about. Most of the book of 1 John is about. Dear brothers and sisters, perhaps a good starting point as we are really running out of time and over time as a matter of fact. A good scriptural point, start, scriptural starting point to understand those good works. Perhaps dear brothers and sisters, we can start learning about the different fruits. Different fruits which is as a result of saving faith produces fruits. Messiah said what? And when we see in Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 onwards, he draws the line that you will know them by their fruits. What are the fruits we are talking about? A scriptural study will lead and let, help us understand today. We'll leave with 
some starting point to understand starting point to understand these what are the fruit basically because we can start learning about this different fruit because this is a result of saving faith dear brothers and sisters and a hallmark of being born again once again this is not works salvation but this is a salvation which works i repeat this is not works salvation but a salvation which works and hopefully i'm being this pun, this is a clumsy pun, dear brothers and sisters. Perhaps what that pun will help us to remember that we do not produce fruit, we bear fruit. It is God working in us. Philippians 2, 13, 4, 12 and 13, it is God working in us. It is the work of the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And there are more fruits than we can imagine, which Galatians 5, 22 and 23, we think about the fruit when we talk about it's just love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Not so. That's one. So today, let's take a look before we end six kinds of fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we will be leaving the scriptures. We are absolutely running out of time. We ran over time. So we'll be leaving the scriptures. Please bear with us. Please do your own study, dear brothers and sisters. Let's keep reading the Bible guided by the Spirit of God. Let's bear fruit for the kingdom. So first is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is targeted towards our character. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 tells us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The Ephesians 5, 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is targeted towards our character. Then is the fruit unto holiness, which is targeted towards a conduct Romans 6 22 what is that fruit unto holiness Romans 6 22 Romans 6 is an astonishing study dear brothers and sisters please take about 10 days to grasp there are 23 verses please do two verses perhaps a day and please go for it Romans chapter 6 word by word digging into the cross references understanding it will be a life-changing experience Romans 6 dear brothers and sisters so much so much of the darkness which on this minefield of confusion will be cleared off, dear brothers and sisters. Romans 6 will teach each one of us that. So the fruit unto holiness, Romans 6.22, but now having set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Third, the fruit of righteousness, which is contentment. Hebrews 12, 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, after it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Philippians 1, 11 tells us the same thing, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Fourth is the fruit of the lips, conversation. Hebrews 13, 15, therefore by him. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of all lips. Offer the sacrifice. Continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. Giving thanks to his name. The fruit of our hands. Fifth, which is our concrete service for God. Proverbs 31, 31. Give her of the fruit of our hands and let her own works and let her own works praise her in the gates. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, which talks about the beam of seed and fruit bearing, it tells us the same things. The sixth is the fruit of righteous, which is about the convert, which Romans 1.13, Proverbs 11.30 tells us. We're running out of time. Please, once again, Romans 1.13, Proverbs 11.30 tells us, dear brothers and sisters, once again, we do hope that from today's message, we do understand of course, from the visions that Messiah's return is upon us, let us once again understand that will the Son of Man find faith that we are believing and trusting and taking Him at His word. And hopefully today from the message of the Beatitudes as led by the Spirit of God, as David spoke to us, hopefully we will be seeking those scriptural blessings to understand what that exactly is about. And hopefully once again we understood a little more about the battle of flesh and spirit 
And if the law leads you once again, the seven churches, the study of the seven churches of the book of Revelation talks about this time. Revelation 1 19 gives us the timeline, which is about the past, present and future. Revelation chapter one is the past. Revelation chapter two and three is the present and four through 22, which is the Jewishness of the book, which is about the future. So hopefully if the Lord leads, please do pray over dear brothers and sisters. Please do go for that and for the fruit of the fruit of the spirit, which is about fruit bearing and glorifying our father. Once again, if you have any questions, if we were, of course, rushing, being too fast, going through that. If you need the scriptures, please, once again, our contacts, our contact will be in the description. And once again, our comment section is open. Let us keep dwelling and digging deeper in the word of God, dear brothers and sisters. It is not about, once again, any one of us. It is about Lord Jesus Christ and he is all set to return. Are we ready to go home? That's the question. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, once again. And today, let's end with a short word of prayer. Shall we, David? Yes. All right, please go. You can please go ahead. Lord, I anoint this time, Lord, those who are about to step out of here, Lord, guide us, Lord, and bless all our viewers, Lord, and help them, Lord, to be in your presence, Lord, and to trust in you, Lord, and to bear fruit, Lord, and to be in your presence at all times, Lord, and to be ready for your return, Lord, as you are telling us, Lord, that you are coming as imminent, Lord, and that you have called us, Lord. Please guide us, Lord, and please bless all our viewers, Lord, and help them, Lord, to trust in you, Lord. And I rebuke the spirit of all the evil coming at us, Lord, and guide us, Lord, and show us what you have for us, Lord, and lead us, Lord, to the truth of your word, Lord. In your holy name, I pray all this. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you once again, David, for praying for us. And thank you, dear brothers and sisters, for viewing us, for being a part of our spiritual family. We thank you so very much once again for being a part of our spiritual family as the law leads. We will be looking forward to hear from you, dear brothers and sisters. We will definitely get to your comments. We do apologize for that, but we will get to your comments. We are definitely reading all of them. We thank you so very much. It is so very helpful, dear brothers and sisters, indeed, in our valleys. We thank you once again again for being a part of a spiritual family for being glorifying God together our Messiah is about to return dear brothers and sisters indeed his return is upon us let us take him at his word and keep digging deeper in his word we thank you dear brothers and sisters and God bless each and every one of you shalom